Uh, Manuel, we, we have many discussions about technologies during these uh, three, three days, uh, namely dedicated to the transformation of uh, business models. Um, so I think it's, it's good to, to listen to you because uh, you will certainly explain to us also the transformation in international politics related to, to technologies. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. So, you know, what, what I, one of the things I find fascinating and that I've seen throughout this, uh, this conference as well is that if you look back, say, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, there was this thesis of the end of history, which I know was very controversial at the time that it was posed, but uh, there was a generalized, there was a certain consensus uh, in the Western world that liberal democracy would move forward and sweep through the world and open markets would do the same and uh, all of the other regimes were on the wrong page, on the wrong side of history and this was going to be a slow process of expansion of this system. Now, what's interesting and it's, it's come up in this conference and it comes up repeatedly in events and meetings and gatherings that I attend is that actually that order, the liberal order, the Western led uh, rules based uh, order of open markets, porous borders, um, multiculturalism is very much fighting for its survival around the world and you know I find that fight to be developing in two very particular fronts I mean one is the external front or the external dimension and it's been mentioned here within that the siege of the order I think is taking place in many areas but I find three of particular importance one is the rise of China and of course everybody has spoken about the rise of China and you know, if you look at, for example, military spending of China in the 1990s, in the early 90s, it was about 40 billion. The budget this year is about 175 billion US dollars. That's what the government has announced. Whether that's the precise figure or not is up to debate, but let's say it's 175 billion. And so the single most significant case of success of economic development of the last 30, 40 years happens to be of a deeply anti-liberal, anti-democratic country uh, that has actually now begin, begun, begun to uh, defend its model even beyond Chinese borders. So when you go to China, if you went 15 years ago, they would be fairly modest about the validity and efficacy of their system. If you go there today, you will find people that are uh, much more uh, bullish about their system and about how viable it is and useful it is for them, but also for regions around the world. So, you know, the biggest uh, development, geopolitical development in the last 40 years seems to point in the direction that actually a well-run, well-managed autocracy does very well uh, in the space of economic development, military development uh, and others. And, and the argument in China now, by the way, speaking about technology, is that technology will help them solve some of the fundamental uh, shortcomings of a centralized system because through AI they're going to be able to solve the information and coordination challenges of a centralized and planned economy and also of an autocratic uh, system that has fewer elections and few social and political rights because through AI they're not going to need the messiness of elections to understand what's happening to their people and react uh, accordingly so that's the messages coming out of China the second external development uh, I think is Russia and the autocratic drift of Russia, and not just that, but Russia's actions internationally. So if you look at the hacking campaigns and the electoral interference campaigns, I was having a, very, a fascinating conversation with an EU official that works in the EU uh, office that fights disinformation. And what you see is that these attacks, whether they happen in the Rust Belt in the US or the Midlands in the UK or uh, uh, France or in, in Catalonia in Spain, visually these attacks seek to undermine the institutions of the liberal order, quite evidently, uh, in most instances. I mean, that's one of the features that connects them. But subversively, and this is uh, a point that I think is sometimes missed, they seek to undermine our faith in our capacity to attain objective truths, right? So they attack the intermediation institutions, whether it's the press, uh, political parties or others. So they seek to make us question uh, the truth and the honesty and legitimacy of the institutions we've built. So they're, they're fundamentally anti-enlightened uh, in the sense that they, they, they seek to undermine uh, our faith in our own institutions. And, uh, they're having growingly, uh, I think they're having uh, success in, in various places, but they're clearly growing in intensity. Now, the third external dimension, I think it's the Middle East. And if you think about what's happened in the Middle East since the middle of the mid-2000s, but particularly since the Arab Spring, has been a systematic failure to democratize the region, right? I think except the case of Tunisia, some of the places where we thought we would be 
uh, establishing or seeing democratic regimes emerge have actually gone back to even more autocratic regimes, and that's, for example, the, the, uh, the case of Egypt, which is particularly salient and significant because of the scale of Egypt. Uh, but that's also the case in Libya, uh, and we're seeing a, an autocratic drift in Saudi Arabia, so it varies in perspective and in intensity, but if you look at the region, I think that the general thrust uh, that we're seeing is actually a reversal of the democratization process. So this idea of the liberal order, of democratic uh, regimes emerging, of you know, uh, the liberal trading system and others uh, deepening, uh, has actually been reversed in a number of places, but particularly I think under attack is the idea of liberal democracy of something that is unavoidable. Now what's fascinating is that, that to this external siege, which uh, has, been in different, has been there in different forms and, and shapes for, uh, uh, for a long time, uh, although punctured by these particular instances, as I mentioned, we are witnessing a real implosion of the liberal order from within the liberal, uh, liberal countries. And, and this is consistent, and, and here I'm getting to the tech piece and, 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 and others. Uh, so we've seen growing numbers of people within the Western world that question liberal, va liberal values, whether it is you know, multiculturalism or, uh, or even democracy. Uh, support for authoritarianism has risen almost consistently across the Western world, uh, the, a questioning of democratic uh, processes uh, and others. Now, why is this happening? Uh, and here I have three fundamental points that I want to make. So we see a great deal of social fracture uh, within the Western world, and some people have mentioned inequality and others, but I, I just want to give you some figures, right? And, and here is another instance of decoupling, by the way. You, you started with some contradictions uh, of decoupling of economic growth at the aggregate and prosperity in the, on the average. So in the U.S., 70% of households in the U.S. have seen no real market income in the last 30 years, right? No real market income increase in the last 30 years. I mean, that's an astonishing figure bearing in mind that the last 30 years have seen very rapid growth at the aggregate in the U.S., uh, even if you take into account the economic crisis. Um, if you look at, for example, uh, life expectancy in some communities in the U.S., life expectancy has fallen for the next generation in the U.S. for the first time since the Second World War in some uh, middle class, mostly middle class, white, uh, economically depressed uh, communities. Child uh, mortality has doubled in some communities in the U.S. again. I mean, this is really shocking data. We only see data like that in countries that have undergone uh, a, a civil war. So uh, some of you might have seen the work done by Angus Deaton on something he calls the deaths of despair, which is the number of suicides and deaths from opioid abuse. If I could uh, show you a map of how wage stagnation and these deaths of despair overlap, you would see almost a perfect, a perfect overlap. Um, so th there are communities within this liberal Western bloc that have clearly not benefited from the process of globalization and changed to the um, uh, economy that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years. This is producing a very significant um, political fracture, and, uh, and this, is, um, this manifests itself in many ways, but I would only point to three that I think are significant. One is an increase of in pessimism about the future uh, within Western societies, about the economic future of the next generation, and this is, again, consistent uh, in polls and surveys uh, in the West, a great deal of anti-elitism or a questioning uh, of how the elites uh, function under legitimacy. And again, we've seen this in polls time and time again, and we've seen a strong correlation between the sense of anti-elitism and anti-establishment sentiment and support for uh, populism, which is, I think, the third manifestation uh, of this. Now, this is, I think, one of the big puzzles of our era, which is, We've seen huge growth in the aggregate. The U.S. returned to pre-crisis uh, GDP levels in 2012. I think the U.K. was about 2014. Even Spain, after a very deep uh, economic crisis, has returned to pre-crisis GDP levels a few months ago. Spain has never ha created as many jobs or sustained as many jobs as it does today. That's at the aggregate level, but when you look at more granularly, lower level, the distribution issue is highly problematic. So we are failing uh, literally at the manage of abundance, at the manage of prosperity within our societies. There is something that has changed in the structure of the economy that is leading to a lot of people being left behind and questioning that order. So I'll finish here because I promised I would be very strict on the time. Uh, that was allotted to me. But when I think about this conference and when I think about world policy and world uh, governance, I cannot... Uh, I cannot say that I think the most significant thing that I see is uh, 
that we are in shift, I think we're in, a, in an era transition, uh, that the liberal order is clearly under siege in a way that it has not been at least since the end of the Cold War, if not before. But shockingly, it is really undergoing a process of implosion from within the order that is produced, in my mind, fundamentally by a compensation failure, uh, which has prevented us from transferring gains in wealth and, and productivity and others uh, to people within, the, uh, within society uh, that have simply been left behind of this process. And, and that picture, uh, I think, is very worrying. I think very few people would have predicted that we would be here uh, 10 years ago. Um, and I think that uh, unless we find ways, and some of us have spoken of uh, fixing the fracture of our social contract moving forward, uh, the political convulsion we're living will deepen and the world will continue to shift to a more illiberal place uh, where the rights of minorities will not be re as, as respected as they have been, both in the West and in other places. We will live in a world with more walls and less movement of people and less commerce uh, and others. And that basically to me means that we're very much living uh, the return of history. I mean, we're, we're, we're moving back into a world where the fundamentals of political uh, governance, both domestically and internationally, are up for grabs and we enter this debate uh, without knowing where, uh, where it's uh, going to lead. So for me, that's the backdrop to, uh, to this conference and that's one of the takeaways um, um, that I take home from this and also from this panel because various bits and pieces of this came up. Thank you. Thank you, my name.